Hey folks, Randy Newberg here with another episode of Leupold's Hunt Talk Radio. Uh, tonight, I have three good guests with me, uh, good friends. Uh, they range from friends I've known for anywhere from 30-some years to two years. Uh, they're all really serious about hunting, serious about conservation and access, and they they all work in, in roles in their daily life that give some perspective about how you approach this stuff if you work for a nonprofit group or if you work for a state agency. So when I get uh, done with the sponsor read here, we're going to have Wade and Kyle and Al, uh, three great guys who are going to share the mic with us and give us the perspective of how those topics of conservation and access work from their their side of the fence, if you want to call it that. But before we get there, uh, you all know that Leupold is the sponsor of this podcast, the title sponsor, title sponsor of everything we do. Hope that if you're in the market for optics, you will go and check out Leupold. Uh, go to leupold.com and you will see that they are the, the maker of amazing optics and as a company, as a brand, huge supporters of hunting, of public land, of shooting, of conservation. And they do that quietly, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of, of promoting what they do for what we love. Uh, and I'm a big fan of the products they make. Uh, the other company, Onyx Maps, uh, you've hear, heard us talk about them in, in all of our video content, everything we do. I tell people that if it wasn't for Onyx, I probably wouldn't be able to hunt anymore just because of how much I've come to rely upon it. Uh, go to onyxmaps.com, use promo code RANDY, and get 20% off your purchase of anything that is an app product. Onyxmaps.com, promo code RANDY, and save 20%. And since we're in the promo code save 20% category, uh... Orion Coolers. Yeah, now we have a promo code with Orion Coolers. You go there, use promo code Randy, and not only will you get the coolest coolers, I don't know if I can say that that many times in a row, you will get an, uh, the best cooler I know of in the coolest colors, and by using promo code Randy, you'll save 20%. So go to OrionCoolers.com, get yourself one of those really, really good coolers. And the last partner that we have is Go Hunt, and you know that it is application season. And most of the podcasts we do this time of year are either focused on applications or have at least some of that woven through each episode. And Go Hunt has a service called the Insider. And we tell people that if you want the most powerful tool at your fingertips, anything from draw odds to public land percentages to unit analysis to the best strategy articles I know of by strategy by state, strategy by species, Go Hunt Insider is the place to go. And again, promo code Randy. If you go to the Go Hunt Insider, you're going to save some money. And here's how it works. When you use that promo code, they give you $50 of free credit in their gear shop. Yeah, the best gear shop I know of for the Western backpack public land hunter like we promote in our show. And then on top of that, when you check out, when you, when you buy stuff in their gear shop, the Go Hunt gear shop, when you check out and use promo code Randy, you save another 10% on everything that you buy. So you've just made a bunch of money by listening to this podcast, or at least going to these companies and using the promo codes. So gohunt.com, sign up for the Insider, get $50 of free mad money in their gear shop by using promo code Randy. And when you check out, use promo code Randy and get another 10% off anything other than optics. Optics aren't included for the promos because they're such a low margin item. They can't make it up on volume if they're losing money on each of them. So gohunt.com, go there, use promo code Randy, save a bunch of money. And when I click the button, you're going to hear the podcast with me and my three pals. All right, folks, I told you that I had three of the world's foremost experts on 
Uh, I'm trying to think. They, they all looked at me like, what are you talking about? <clears throat> to my left is Kyle Dutrote. Kyle, I always mess up your name. I hope I got it right. You got it right. All right. Kyle works for Arizona Game and Fish, and you are the I Landowner Relations... Landowner Relations Program Coordinator. Program Coordinator. I forget it myself sometimes. So. All right. And then over to my right is Al Iden, who... Well, that one time in Arizona, when I first met you, you were at Arizona right. Game and Fish. That's right, yeah. A and now you're with... Now Pheasant. I'm with Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever, yeah. Yeah, and what do you do for them? I'm our West Region Director, so Ooh. I get to oversee all the, the Every, stuff we do in the uh, Western what, what, United States. What's West? The Mississippi or no, Rocky Mountain? Not, no, or? Not, not from the Mississippi. Uh, basically, New Mexico, north to Montana, over to the ocean. Wow. So. You got California, you got Yeah, I got Arizona, California, or? Arizona, New Mexico, I got... Oregon, Pacific Northwest. I even have Alaska and Hawaii, which we're working on. But really, yeah, you gonna introduce pheasants in Alaska someday? There's pheasants up there already. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, they've been there I said for a that long jokingly. Time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're hanging out. I mean, they make they live in Minnesota. How can they not live in Anchorage? Oh, know? that's true. So. I guess that's that's. A yeah, <laughs> but if I but if I lived in Alaska, I'd be chasing grouse and ptarmigan. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But and then next to him is Wade Zarlingo. Wade's been on our podcast before. Uh, Wade is first and foremost an old college buddy, uh, and those would be more colorful stories, I think. Wade. Yeah, we'll stay away from those tonight. Really? <laughs> we probably should. Yeah, you don't want your twenty whatever six seven years of vested service at game. No, and fish. especially when I've got an eighteen year old son at home that might hear this. Right. <laughs> 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 uh, all right. <clears throat> well, the reason that, that we're on this podcast is it's kind of the intersection of so many cool things. Uh, it's Arizona specific because we're sitting here in our deer camp, our pheasant, uh, or not pheasant camp, quail camp, javelina camp, jackrabbit camp. It could, it could be the camp of just about anything everything yeah, i think the only thing we missed on why you guys were down here is waterfowl yeah but we tried Other that than the falconry the, stuff right. now that was wasn't that impressive that was impressive to watch that was so cool so we could call it an anything camp because you folks in arizona believe that diversity or variety is the spice of life absolutely there is is there anything that does not exist in arizona there's a lot of mountain things. goats, grizzly bears, grizzly bears, <laughs> and we don't have any of those. So, uh. but there's we've yeah, there's a few things we're missing for sure. Wade's but, uh, gonna start naming all his bird species he wants to go after. So, yeah, <laughs> it'll be a long list. Well, that's really? that's yeah. another thing we started this year. Not probably got a little off track. But we no, started, wait, we, wait, every, everything's a tangent here, Wade. So we started we started Upland Challenge this year. What's for Upland, a small game? Tell me what Upland. Challenge so basically, is. we have a desert challenge. A mountain challenge, uh, ultimate upland challenge, and then the the native quail challenge. And tell me what the, how does that what, what's a challenge? So the challenge is like for the native quail. We've got uh, scale quail. Yeah. Uh, we've got Mern's quail, yeah. and then we have Gamble's quail. Right. So to take all three of those in one season. Okay. And basically, it's really a neat thing, and it's yeah. a partnership yeah. with uh, with Quail Forever here and a local chapter here where. It's a registration fee is twenty five dollars. Yeah, and then for that twenty five dollars, the the chapter yep. will donate another twenty five dollars. Goes strictly to up to habitat work fifty for bucks small game. for anyone. Here. Fifty bucks, yeah. right towards you know? habitat. Yeah, and then you know we and they get a really nice plaque. It's mm -hmm. got a little a brass plate that describe that shows the title of that, and there's four spots on there. Yeah, uh, for all the challenge orders, you can do all four years of the of the quail challenge. Mm. So, so that fifty dollars, then where does that go? Well, a lot of what we're at least with that chapter, they're focused right now is on one of our wildlife areas. Okay, where we're, yeah. it's right outside of the metropolitan area of Phoenix, and we're really trying to use that as a recruitment center for the most part. Recruit a hunter, for hunter recruitment, gotcha. so we can bring people out there, youth, young adults, yeah. old adults, whatever it is, and get them out in the field on their first dove hunts. And then we can also run, uh, you know, planted birds behind bird dogs to just okay. kind of get them, get them interested in that side of things. You guys have a yeah. wildlife management area outside of Phoenix? We do. It's just out, it's out toward Buckeye. Really? So as if you were taking, what is Interstate 10? Yeah. Interstate 10. Uh, yeah. On the yeah. southwest side yeah. of the valley. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's right there. I mean, it's, I think, 
I think Phoenix is the fifth largest metropolitan area in the country. Wow. And so there's a lot of people to draw from in, in an area that, uh, you know, we, we look at numbers a lot. And uh, we've got a, an increasing population in, in our, and our hunter numbers are going down like they are everywhere right. in the country. And it's just a really unique area that's close to Phoenix. Yeah. Where we can introduce people to hunting. So, uh, yeah, it's just, cool. it's, a, it's a really cool deal. I mean, the the reason that the Quail Forever chapter was so excited about it is is uh, that tie to the hunter recruitment and you know all mm -hmm. the people you know, yeah. uh, but also um, you know just getting some active management done on a wildlife area in Arizona is a really cool deal. And and this chapter has been just itching itching to try to do something what can we do to right. help with this stuff yeah and uh when when wade in his former life and game and fish approached him they just jumped all over it they couldn't wait to help and really? uh yeah yeah and, and and a lot of it has to do with with the fact that hey we're gonna we're gonna do something good for the land but we are also gonna do something that brings more people hunting and yeah. that that's a big part of our mission and it was it's been great to kind of partner with arizona game and fish to to do something that really has a chance to to be scalable Right. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of programs out there that are doing great things, great things. Yeah. Um, but when you got what three million people that you can tap with a 45 minute drive, that's a pretty neat, pretty neat opportunity that yeah, you just don't definitely. see everywhere. So. Wow, I did not know that was there. So, what's your gateway drug to getting hunters here in Arizona? Is it small game? Is it birds? Is it what? Big game? There's a couple different things. They're definitely small game. Our numbers have been down recently as far as our gambles, quail numbers, which is the most obtainable of our small game, I it's think. The, for those who grew up where I did, it's the one <clears throat> that's on your logo. It's the little curly Q right, it's got quail a top, with the... Yeah, it's got a top knot, I guess. Is, uh, is that yeah. what they call that, yeah. a top knot? Yeah. So. I, I've yeah. heard that, like, the hipster crowd have a hot yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and you are a hipster if you get out and kill some of those birds when you're out there okay. walking, right? All right? So that's uh, the most widely distributed? Oh, by far, yeah. And what about, like, jackrabbits, cottontails? Oh, they're, yeah, the jackrabbits, you know, we've got the black-tailed jackrabbits as we move f further north from where we're at, and we're in very southern Arizona. Yeah. Uh, but down here, we also have the antelope jackrabbit, which we, yeah. we had an opportunity this year to... <laughs> Unbelievable food. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I did what you call pole axe one. <laughs> I well, got, you can't wait for pole axe. Huh? I pole yeah, axe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't know where the word pole axe came from, but when I was a little kid, if somebody really made a remarkable shot, you pole axed him. <laughs> and, and that just kind of grew with me where now everything I shoot, I just pole axed him. <laughs> People look at like me like, what, what does that mean? I, I quite honestly don't know the origin <laughs> of pole axe, but that rabbit with that 20 gauge with number sixes had my over and under. And the first one got away. <clears throat> he is, those are, those are, what, I keep wanting to call them pronghorn jackrabbits, but they're antelope <laughs> yeah, jackrabbits. Jack uh, those antelope jackrabbits, you never know. Sometimes they'll only run 30 yards, and sometimes they'll run completely out of sight. And, and they, they fly when they run. It, it looks like Almost. it. Almost. <laughs> they're, they're off the ground when they're moving. Yeah. I mean, I mean they're kicking up dust like a four-bottom yeah. plow when they're getting right. out of town. It's <laughs> just like you just see this cloud of dust drifting away. Well, this one, he thought he was hid behind a bush. Not so much, huh? Not so much. He uh, <laughs> he ended up being dinner, and the amount of meat you get off uh, an antelope jackrabbit, it's crazy. I, I have no idea how much meat, uh -huh. but it served a lot of people. And not just meat, but good meat. R really, really yeah. good meat. Right. Everybody who left here the next morning when we're out go going deer hunting, everyone's... Man, I'm I'm going jackrabbit hunting. <laughs> wow. If I see a jackrabbit, he's in trouble. Yeah, I was a little bit disappointing to come back, and I thought there was going to be a pile of them. I know Nothing. those guys aren't p pulling their weight. <laughs> I if I I've hunted deer daylight to dark the last two days, so unfortunately I've had to give the jackrabbits a break. <laughs> but when I come down next year, I'm hunting deer from daylight till ten in the morning, and then it's jackrabbits from ten until four, and then it's back to deer. Because I'm sure I can't shoot any less deer than I've shot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I may as well go stack up. Is there a limit on those jackrabbits? I should have looked at the regulation. Uh, I, I should know, but I don't believe there is. Right, okay. But well, uh, don't take my word on that. No, I'll yeah. check the regulations. Check the we got some regulations over there yeah. on the table. Yeah. It's, it's well, we had the wildlife manager here earlier. Yeah. He would know. But I, we, you have I the wrong people. I should have asked him, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Jared, I should have said, hey, yo, Jared, uh, how many of these antelope jackrabbits can I get? I guarantee get? you we only killed one, so nobody right. was over we're, the limit. Yeah, we're, we're, safe. we're, we're well safe. under limit for yeah. the trip. <laughs> but as good eating as they are, oh, my goodness. So if I lived here, jackrabbits, at least antelope jackrabbits, would be like the gateway opportunity that I'd introduce kids to. And, you and guys, they, yeah. they do do a junior's camp down here right. for, for antelope jackrabbits. Yeah. And, uh, it's a pretty big event for our the region five which is out of the tucson office okay and they they draw they draw a pretty big crowd for that and it's 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 pretty neat it's, that's really cool jim uh, heffelfinger who works for the agency was telling me about that right and, uh i'm gonna have i i committed him jim's gonna be a, he and i are gonna report record a podcast when we're intersecting travel schedules in salt lake city so nice. I'm going to ask him again about those jackrabbit camps because it sounds like you get to go one time and they, it, when I shot that one, he was telling us, it, he said, this is what we do in the jackrabbit camp. So he had his little uh, carabiner on a, on a rope that we hung up from a tree and he said that he uses these jackrabbits, they're big enough, you can almost teach kids the gutless method oh, of no taking care of a deer right. or a javelina yeah. with a jackrabbit. Wow. <clears throat> so he makes them do everything. He he helps them, it sounds like, shows them where to make the first cut. And once you make the first cut in the skin, obviously right. rabbit hide is yeah. so thin. And you just take it out. And then he says, well, we work on them here. Get the front shoulder off this side, the front shoulder <laughs> off that side. Get the back straps. The back straps off this jackrabbit. Oh, gosh, We're dang. almost as big as on the javelina. <laughs> How does a rabbit have that kind of back straps? Is that is that just... <sighs> Anatomically, they got to be built that way to run that fast. Uh, I think there's can, something to it. I don't know. <laughs> I just know they taste good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so we did that, and then we took the hindquarters off. And by the time we were all done, it's the same as if I were to have done the gutless method on a deer. And so his his point was that you get taught one field care uh, of an animal and you get taught you know some hunting skills of these because these rabbits it's a so, spot and stock effort exactly right? yeah. yeah it's very much how you would would do it so huh i th i i thought that would be the gateway uh opportunity to hunting for uh, i don't know maybe in the metro area it's not as accessible to for rabbits would you have to go a long ways no you don't have to go far for cottontails for sure they're they're about it in every habitat we have in Arizona, uh, yeah, to some degree. And there, you have to walk for them. You have to work for them, just like anything else. But that's part of hunting, right? And that's yeah. it. Does it does start that that process thinking and and trying to get them into into the field and then put it in the fryer or ever however you cook it and yeah. and and the importance of that side of things too that yeah. you don't just shoot them. And, leave them lay right which when i was a kid i shot a lot of jackrabbits which i and left them lay yeah i wouldn't do that now no, after no. having the food that we've had right and i think you kind of mature well you that, know, as you get started you shoot about everything and mm -hmm. as you move up you kind of grab a little bit of ethics and kind of move up to where you're you're shooting things that, that you're going to eat right yeah. and that's yeah. just part of the i think it's just part of the the growing up i guess i, I think that's, it's that i think it's also part of just the trend in our community of hunters that it we are focused heavily on the food and we figure out ways to do it <clears throat> and while we're doing this jonathan <laughs> odell from arizona Ga uh, jonathan what's your title a uh, small game migratory game bird biologist brought us forks with what do we got on here crane more oh, crane yeah. oh the way the crane is supposed to be cooked all right it's not too bad is it wow so, if you hear a bunch of chewing, folks, uh, that's because there is a bunch of chewing. There's a bunch of chewing going on. <laughs> if anyone would have told me that Sandhill Crane could taste as good as Jonathan Odell makes it, in Montana, we got to apply for a Sandhill Crane permit. Do yeah. you got to apply? Yeah, we have a yeah, we do. We have a here, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm. Wow. That's really, really gotta good. Got to kind of savor that's... it for a little bit. There might be a little quiet. A little time silence. There. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, folks. Um, I. The the flavors and the the smells are not coming through on the podcast. I know all you're hearing is just a smacking of <laughs> teeth and the clacking, but I was fantastic. Hmm. Is is that one of the criteria to work for Game and Fish? You got to be a fantastic wild game chef. 
That's why I had to leave. I can't cook. So. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know. They gave me a job. So <laughs> Al was there for a long time. But he kept taking remedial cooking. Yeah. And it <laughs> just never sunk out. in, man. It never <laughs> sunk in. Uh, well, since you guys uh, are all somewhat related to this, in engaged in the access world that my audience is really big into the access stuff we we make a big deal about public lands about public access and that's why i think it was really important that before we all parted ways try to get a quick podcast about sure. what programs are out there what arizona game and fish is doing and hopefully if someone's listening to this if their state isn't doing some of these things or taking advantage of some of these things, hopefully someone says, hey, you know, there are these options out there. I, I would hope that every agency has access people, but when agency budgets get cut, a lot of times the yeah. access side of things. Access is a big deal for all the states. And we, and we put a big emphasis yeah. on it in Arizona. We, we have a lot of dedicated funding that goes strictly to access, and one of those is our application fees. We we take three dollars off the top of an application fee that's dedicated to access in Arizona for resident and non-resident applications. For resident that's and right. non-resident. Okay. So how many points you got, Kyle? You were telling me you had a whole gun. I've got there. ten elk points. So, so every time I apply, you three dollars are going towards access. Which a lot of people would say, well, three dollars isn't much, but when you have we got a lot of people putting in there. Right. Yeah. I know. And, it, and it's every application for every season oh, so for every deal. So that's so 15 if I bucks. do elk and antelope in February, because your deadline's coming up on, what, the 12th? We I said think. thank you for your thank six you. bucks. So $6 <laughs> will, will go into earmark to your access program. Yeah, and to take a step back, we've got, we've got seven staff around the state working on this stuff. Um, they split their time between that and the habitat work we do with, with our ranchers, but um, seven staff around the state working on, working on access to get you know through and onto private property in this state. So, so when you say through, a lot of times it's private property that where maybe a road crosses that you don't have an easement on or something? Exactly. You know, maybe even in this neck of the woods, there's landlocked, you know, forest service lands that we need to get a road through and, and, and we can do that in some instances. So, so willing by, willing, two willing parties. It, yes. No, it's not like you're going and saying, no. hey, we're going to force our way through here. <laughs> no. Completely <laughs> voluntary well, programs. And, that, and that's really why, cool. therefore, the title, Landowner Relations Program, for the most part. That's really what we focus on is building relationships with landowners mm -hmm. and doing beneficial projects and access. And we like to reward good partners, right? If right. We have some ranchers that allow access. Right. We approach them and say, hey, are you willing to work with us on habitat? You know, and, and we'll, we'll provide some incentives for, for maintaining the access that we already have. Yeah. And that's pretty important to our program. It's, it's rewarding the good behavior yep. just yeah. like anything else, right? Yeah. If we've got ranchers that, are, that, are, that love working with us and doing stuff, I mean, we... You want to work with them? We want to reach, work with them. It's no, it's no different than anything else. So. And the yeah. flip side is if you work with a squeaky wheel, guess what you're going to get? More squeaky wheels. More squeaky yeah. wheels. And so, you know, you got, I mean, that's the beauty of the program that Arizona has, has really built in their focus. Well, I've taken advantage of it. Um, Wade, you and I and Jonathan went quail hunting. Was, was that part of your, what, is it called BPA? Is that, am I saying that The right? voluntary public access. Yeah, so, so that's, that's. And there's a, more to, and Habitat. Improvement yeah, program. Yeah. It's a hip. big, Vipa it's hip. Big. Vipa hip. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because we took advantage of that over in Yuma, right? Is it was that part of the program? yeah the it dove was. hunting? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I'm keeping it right now unless lightning strikes and I draw this special tag I'm applying for. <laughs> I will be available opening weekend of dove, dove season next year. We so need to do that again. We, sure. I, I might be back in Yuma. Yeah, that was more fun. I, I don't know what you can do on September first. It's that much fun. It, you, you shoot your doves. You take them to this restaurant Jonathan knew about or you knew about. Yep. You you bring them there or just as you took them from the field, feathers and all, and they say you want poppers or tacos, and you go sit down and pretty soon here comes your doves about an hour later yeah. in the form of whatever you. Not ask a bad for. business model either, right? Oh. 
Sign me I mean, up. Yeah, I mean, even for the the restaurants that do it, I mean, you've, you're sitting there and you're waiting for your food, and, yeah, you, and they, yeah, you're you're partaking in other things while yeah. you're there. <laughs> so. uh, uh, no, it, it was great to have that program, and I don't know what the hunter day use was for those properties, but it was really high. I bet. At the number of hunters who were there. Oh, it's 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 incredible. Our, our dove plots down in Yuma, and I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but it, the amount of use they get is incredible. Yeah. Now, what's cool about that program, expanding on what's going on in Arizona, is every state can make it their own. Yeah. So that, I mean, depending, depending on where your listeners are at, right, if they're living in Minnesota or they're living in Montana, whatever those state wildlife agencies do, that program fits it. They made right. it so broad so to, help, when, to help what the local hunt, you know, local agencies want to do. So when you say, uh, Al, that they made it so broad, you're talking about legislators the, and 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 the people that wrote the farm bill. Okay. So the the, the as it's been developed, there's a bunch of uh, you know conservation organizations that really pushed that program years and years ago, like we talked about in the past, right? right. And uh, one of the things that all the all the uh, conservation organizations wanted to do was make sure that it was flexible enough mm-hmm. to, to help everywhere. Right, it's a because national what, program. what works in Tennessee may not be what works in Arizona. No may question. May not be what works in Wyoming. No or, question. Huh. And so um, Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever, and a bunch of other partners really pushed hard in this last reauthorization. And you know, like you know, every legislative effort has good things that come out and things that you you know are going to work on again. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and and the VIPA HIP was one where it, you know it was a forty million dollar program that went up to fifty million dollars. Right. So that should mean there's more dove hunting opportunities for you as long as Kyle writes a really good grant. So, uh, <laughs> good the luck. pressure's on. So Kyle. we might be in trouble. So, uh, no. <laughs> so the the mechanism of how this works, and I think this is helpful for people to understand. So the farm bill fortunately got passed before the shutdown. That That's right. we're currently dealing with. Yep. And in that farm bill, is it under Department of Ag, it, which, which so yep. it, which, yeah. and then it, which is the next branch that it goes so to? So for the for the for this hit, funding, this, yeah. yeah, it goes Department of Ag into the Natural Resource N- Conservation N- Service. NRCS. NRCS. Natural yep. Resource Conservation yep. Service. And they in run the, it out of a national kind of grant type of situation. Okay, so and the states apply for that grant? Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. State wildlife or any state agency can apply for that grant, but there, okay. you know, it has to tie into some sort of outdoor recreation, hunting and fishing right. kind of thing. So, does do you, does it every state take advantage of it or no? So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, la- the we last we took advantage yeah. of it. I'll say that much. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, Wait for we, you. It, here in Arizona, we got a good good chunk of change last time around, and it really helped expand on our yeah. existing program, and it's gone a long ways. Yeah. It's been Are great. You, are you able to leverage it or match it with other funds uh, in other places? Yeah, yeah. We so like Wade had mentioned, your your three dollar application fee is going towards this, and we can we can leverage it against other folks' dollars. And in fact, um, Al with PFQF, uh, we're we're working on trying to do do an access agreement right now. So cool. Yeah. So and we we try and we try and. We try and make the money go as far as we can. Right. We we match about every dollar that we have to, to well, some other it, program. And usually these these folks, when we enter into an agreement with them, these, these ranchers typically or private landowners, um, the funding that they get, they're usually putting it back onto their ranch somehow. Mm-hmm. So they can take that money and then leverage it against other programs out but, there, you know, whether it's Fish and Wildlife Service programs or HPC program that we have internally. And basically double that money to do on the ground habitat work, yeah. and and most of them take advantage of that. They the do the ones we work with because we built that relationship, right? Okay. And they take yeah. advantage of that that ability to double that money and put it on the ground for habitat, which increases our bang for the buck for sure. So right, because but, but that's huge. You know, the importance of that is can't be understated. These guys could take that money and go buy a truck, go do whatever they might want to do and they're choosing to go do good habitat work or most of them are which right. which is, right. is awesome you so, know and our, our ranchers are they're good stewards of the land for the mm-hmm. most part I oh mean, they, yeah they they take care of things out there for yeah. us yeah i mean we that uh antelope hunt that jerry had oh, that yeah. you were you, right. you kind of led us down that path yeah we, we we put a lot of effort into habitat along with the rancher out there 
and we saw a huge return on our antelope numbers. And that's when we went on that hunt was right kind of in that, Just I mean, that in a pretty a peak. Yeah, yeah it was 2014, I think, yeah. when Jerry, 14 mm. or 15, he drew that tag. And we went out there, unbelievable amount of, of water that when you think of that part of arizona hey it's yeah it's up on the plateau but it's still a dry arid yeah, place I, if i remember right we had 32 miles of pipeline wow and like 28 drinkers on that ranch and a, the, it, it was a pretty amazing i think it's even more than that it, yeah, yeah. That was, those were the numbers kind of i was wearing that was years ago when i was working on that uh, you know that project and so one of the deals of that is they open it up to public hunting access right that's correct and so the benefit to the, the agency helps them through water installations water infrastructure range improvements whatever they enter in their part of that deal is okay i'm going to do that uh i'm going to receive some cash or some co-op money to do this project in exchange i'm going to open my property to hunting well, not necessarily. Am I, am I oversimplifying? Yeah, kind of. Be, well, a lot of them are already allowing some sort of access. It's the, what oh, we had talked okay. about earlier. Yeah. But Rewarding they're able them. to take that and, and do the leveraging and do the habitat work based on that. And, you know, access is a big part of that, but it's not always it's not always the driver. It's yeah. not always, what. hey, we're not going to work on your land if you're not going to allow access. We do stuff that's just habitat habitat driven. Got it. Yeah, if it's, it's if it's good for wildlife, we're we're not necessarily not going to do it just because they don't allow access. Got it. But in the case of that ranch you're talking about, uh, that rancher chose to take the access funding that we provided him to ensure access for the next five years and put it back on the ground to do to make the dollars go further for some habitat work. Wow. Yeah. So how long are most these agreements? One year, five year, ten year? They vary. Uh, they vary a lot. We okay. we have some perpetual easements. Okay. Uh, which is a long time. Yeah, that's a long, <laughs> that's a long longer time. than we're gonna live. <laughs> right. So, uh, but uh, the majority. Uh, as Randy Travis saying, a long, long time <laughs> is forever. That's yeah. right. <laughs> so it's a uh, uh, we we have them from shortest up to a year, a month. We got our dove plots are they're they're a year term, but essentially you're just getting dove season days. out of them. Fifteen days. Oh, okay. Uh, they, so that early dove hunt is when you get the most out of those yep, plots. Yep, yep. And then, and then we have ones, typically they don't go much beyond 10 years. But So I, I'd say the average is about seven years. Okay. Well, it's, It gets it, back to that variability, right? And what does the landowner want? These guys built this program on relationships, right? I think you built this program. I'm pretty sure you, you were guys right built this program. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm before, so proud to hear these guys say the things I taught them. It's so awesome. <laughs> so yeah, before Al left, he had, he'd put a lot of effort into the department and building a, just a, a tremendous landowner relations mm -hmm. program. Yeah. And I think that was kind of the kind of the vaulting point for him. It opened up oh, some absolutely. doors and some opportunities for him because, he, I mean, he demonstrated what he could do. Right. And it, it was, it's a pretty impressive program and <laughs> it's still continuing on. I mean, it's not, it's not falling apart yet. <laughs> no, it's, it's, getting, it's getting better. <laughs> I think. You know, you got rid of the dead weight. So yeah. uh, but to do that and to make a lot of this work, this is and one thing I often try to explain, or even for myself, I try to learn, is how intricate some of these programs are in their funding yeah. and where the funding comes from. And Al, you're going to be modest in this, but I know you're kind of a what would I call it, a CSI guy of <laughs> figuring out where there is funding for projects. Yeah, right? I guess I'm sneaky about that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah. But that requires you to be listening and engaging probably at a national level. Well, at a national level, and I mean, you know, a lot of the the federal programs that are out there, I mean, you do have to pay attention to, uh, you know, as much as I'm not a political person, you have to pay attention to what's going on. Yeah. And, uh, you know, working for a state agency, it's, it's a, you're a little handcuffed in what you can say or what you can't say. Right. I work for a 501c3, so I also have that same handcuff. Yeah. See, me, that's why the subtitle um, of this podcast is Randy Newberg Unfiltered. Yeah. yeah. I'd say it <laughs> but, that but the flip side is, is once these wonderful things do come out, and there are good things that do come out, yeah. um, you know, there, there's lots of opportunities, and, and, and finding that, that common ground amongst all of them is important. 
you know, in the West here, you got the, the big game corridor issue, right? There, yeah. There's a bunch of there's a bunch of effort going in from BLM, especially, but the Forest Service as well. Yeah. Well, how does that tie into Farm Bill stuff? How does that tie into Arizona Game and Fish programs? Well, it all yeah. ties down to that that one acre, right? Yeah. And then who controls that acre? There could be go. the forest, could be whatever, but there's all there's almost always an agricultural producer that ties right. to that. So that's how you bring these farm bill things. And then it's just a matter of looking at all right, here's what we need to do. Yeah. I can go here, I can go here, I can go here, and you cobble that all together. So that's kind of what Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever actually is one of the one of the drivers that that really attracted me to that organization is they're really keyed into those things as well. Yeah. And and they're really um good about exploit is exploiting a good word to talk uh, we, about we, we exploit <laughs> but, a lot of yeah that. so we we exploit the the heck out of out of these really cool programs to get the best possible outcome that we can get and you know you were talking about leveraging that it's it's amazing um how far money can go when you really think about when you focus on what everybody wants versus what I want. What I want. Yeah. And uh, and you, these guys probably remember me telling them, I was like, if you got a good idea, money's not a limitation. You know. Ooh. <laughs> and and they, they they challenge me on it all the time. And yeah. and there is a limitation. Don't get me wrong. Right. But but yeah. uh, but you know, when you have a good idea that resonates, you can get you can make big things happen. Yeah. And so that's yeah. a, that's what that's what's happening in Arizona. Yeah, you know, part of this, I mean, it's really not the agencies take a lead, not a lead role in it, mm -hmm. but you know, the five hundred one. Oh yeah, they yeah. they take they take a big lead in it, yeah. but it, it's really up to everybody that enjoys what we do out here. Sure, you know, sure. and making their voices heard through whatever they whatever do. And I don't want to yeah. go there, but yeah, you know, it's important that people take a stance on that stuff and 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 well, vote sure. vote that way and make their Absolutely. conscience heard. But you you know, were talking it's, about it's how three dollars of the access money from the the application fee. So you know the history behind that. The rest of that money also goes to really good stuff. Of that whole application fee. Access, habitat restoration, and hunter recruit and retention. Every single really? dollar that comes out of that goes to one of those three programs. It's, That's Arizona Game and Fish. Right. right. And those are state dollars. And they those can are be state matched dollars. to federal dollars. So right. now we're talking about, yeah, the matching, the leveraging. And so you, you multiply Pittman that up. Funds through Pittman else. Robertson funds or to to other, other, other any other funds. Corporate, right. you, you know, there's all kinds of different federal uh, funding out there. Heck, Kyle's an expert on. EPA money. I don't know if we want to talk about what? EPA, but uh, EPA money. But you know, you can use. You know, they're out there trying to reduce sediment and cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. So we we partnered with the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, who, yeah. who they receive a pot of this EPA money every year, and uh, we've been very successful working with them. And it, it requires match, just like we mentioned. So it is a good example of this. Um, our goals tend to align on a lot of these projects. You know, they're trying to reduce sediment and do things that are good, you know, good for the watershed. Heck, what's good for the watershed is good, good for the for, wildlife. Yeah. So. Ha, I didn't know that. Yeah. If I would have listened to my news feed, I would have thought that EPA stuff, we just need to, that, that's just a, you know. Devils in Problem. the de devils <laughs> in the details, of course, but, you know. But we haven't really, t I mean, we, talk we touched on Farm Bill. I mean, honestly, that's where the, Big the big pot, you know, yeah. um, new farm bill, you know, there's $30 billion in that thing over yeah. five years for conservation. Yeah. There, is there a lot of CRP, Conservation Reserve Program? Uh, there, is there much so of it to enroll in a place like I get hammered like about Arizona? that with my new group of friends because yeah. Arizona has zero acres and every other state has some CRP. So yeah. they, they tease me quite a bit. But, <laughs> you know, CRP was a, you know, was one of those areas that we, we, made improvements but didn't get everything yeah. that we wanted in this last one. But, you know, the cap went up 3 million acres. So that means there's going to be 3 million more acres of right. upland habitat in the country to help all wildlife, yeah. know, pheasants, quail, whatever, but uh, but also deer. And, I mean, right. you it's, know. Just, it's hard to, you know, a lot of those programs are designed for mm -hmm. the Midwest, right? Yeah. That and, one in particular. And, yeah, and that one in particular. Yeah. So they, they pay, yeah. there's a payment for resting mm -hmm. or letting it go. Yep. You know, kind of back or replanting to yep. native vegetation, and we it, it works. It, it works for dry land, taking dry land crop out of production. Right. If you have all irrigated crop land, it, it, it's too productive. You, you can't and you be, got it, too much. the economics. Yeah. Come, it, it makes it difficult. Yeah, but you know. Well, but, I know that CRP is really good for big game. Also, yeah. well, the amount of deer and antelope that benefit from CRP 
It's crazy. Right. Uh-huh. Right. Uh-huh. Everyone thinks it's just a bird hunter, or bird watcher right. kind of program. Well, that's uh-huh. that's one thing we really focus on is a good habitat's good habitat. Yep. It's good habitat for everything. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, if we're focusing on what the habitat should be, uh, we're we're doing everything justice, right? That's so right. that's right. Uh, so you guys are, uh, in your agency, you are charged with a lot of diverse tasks, habitat, recruitment, landowner relations, uh, 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 you know, the managing the wildlife, the, the list goes on and on and on of what you guys are expected to do. And then I got Al over here saying, oh, if that's a good idea, money's not an object. Uh, every state agency has money as an ob. You know, they're, 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 you're all constrained in your budgets. How how does how do you take an access program and make the case within the state budget? Hey, this is why access is so important to our agency and to our constituents. Does that who's that fall on you guys? Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, I, I think <laughs> the, for the, the easiest. I guess I'm the one with the answer. <laughs> I think the easiest answer is those are our customers, right? That they're, they're they're trying to access those lands to recreate, to hunt, to fish, whatever the case may be, and. If we don't have land to do that on, we're in we're in deep trouble. Yeah. You know? Even going further back, you know, you look at the economics, right? I mean, outdoor hunting is an outdoor recreation. It brings people either from Phoenix to to where we're at here in Aravipa or from somewhere yeah. else here to Arizona or, you know, broaden it back out to the national level. The right. reason VIPA hip came through was because there was a bunch of studies done to determine, hey, look at the economic impact of, you know, this $40 million. Um, oh, wow. And so that resonates, and so it resonates at, at the political level, but, and I'm kind of stepping back into my old role back with Game and Fish, that was what helped resonate getting budgets within, you know, right. within the state agencies. You had to tie it to, we're getting people outside. If we don't have this, if we lose access, how are you going to sell tags? Right. You know, and then... And if you don't sell tags, you got this funding, this funding sure, shortage. And if you yeah. can't con- to convince the governor or the governor's office that Arizona Game and Fish is important, it goes away. You know, yeah. the, the, and so all that tied together when you when you p- make that message to your 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 wildlife agency, and all of them already know this, right? It's not. Right. It's just yeah. a matter of reminding your leaders that hey, this is this is important too. Yeah. Well, well, and I think I think you, my, your previous examples, the. The perfect example. You, you saw all the hunters down there when you were down oh, there. Oh my gosh! What do you think that's Cal- doing I for the half local of California economy? California was there. <laughs> <laughs> the local mm-hmm. economy's probably uh, liking that time of year. So. Yeah, you go into town. It's like dove hunters welcome. It, there, every place you go, there's dove hunting painted on sure. the r- diner windows. Dove hunters come eat here. Blah blah blah. So, so one of the neat things that came out this past year, I don't know if you've heard this yet, but I was I was uh, one of our partner biologists works down in Yuma now, and I asked her, I say, how'd the quail hunt go? What were the numbers and things like that? She calls me back and says, well, we couldn't figure out the numbers, but the Yuma Office of Tourism said hotels and restaurants and one other uh, thing were up 50% in revenue, this, wow. this dove hunt compared to last year. Oh, for the dove hunt. Because I was going to say our our gambles quail numbers are pretty far down. <laughs> I don't. Oh, for the dove hunt, they, they were able to, they were able to tell for that, 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 that dove season, the hotels and restaurants made 50% more money than they did last year. Wow. Oh, uh, you well, know. I'll take all the credit for that. And it's because of Randy. Yeah. 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 All, all, our YouTube, all, those people. all of our YouTube but, videos and me telling everybody but about it. The, the, ha, top, ha. the Office of Tourism <laughs> was very clear when they talked to the Arizona Game and Fish Department that we believe the majority of this is because of that program and the promotions, you know, that you yeah. did, Randy, but everybody, there's been a right, bunch of promotions. There's tons of people and, doing uh, yeah. You know, and so that just kind of completely, I mean, that's, that's a big sell. Right, that, that gives you a lot of credibility and, and clout mm-hmm. outside of the agency. Outside of the agency. And then, then huh. how do you get more money to come into the agency? You right. know, someday, when the stars align, you use those kinds of arguments to get oh, these small town. The small towns is really where you feel mm-hmm. that impact, right? Yeah. Right. These, the, uh, I mean, where we're at this today. This is a perfect uh, example here. Yeah. You know, I mean, you go uh, you go into the store here, and there's pictures of deer on the wall. I know, I love it. You know, yeah, it's yeah. just it's it's really a yeah. nice thing. It kind of yeah. steps you back, which is mm-hmm. not a great thing, but, <laughs> but it steps yeah. you back to where 
where we grew up, and that's been a while. But yeah. you know, you had your all your your little markets and stuff had places where you could go hang your deer and get your picture taken. I remember that as yeah, a kid, for sure. You it, know, this little market here in town, above all of the cold items and freezer items, the whole wall is full of pictures of oh, mostly kids Absolutely. with their deer. Really? And then the, at the end of the season, they take them all down and they keep them in this three-ring binder so you can go look at past seasons. And then when season starts again, they start the whole thing. It, it, I walked in there, I'm like, man. Did you see man, a little kid in there? How cool is that? I want to be on that wall. What's there, that did you see the little kid in there? It was probably was his first Oof. year. Oh, that thing no was way. huge. And it was a monster yeah. deer, and he was smiling from oh, ear yeah. to ear. It was just, you could tell that was one of those things that he'll never forget. Right, mm-hmm. he's a hunter for life. Yeah. It, it looked like a Midwest whitetail. Really? Not, not a cow's <laughs> whitetail. That thing was big. I'm like, you know, And he didn't do that on his own. He had. To, I'm guaranteed he had, he had the whole family down there, yeah. right? Right. I mean, he probably had dad and grandpa or mom and dad and grandpa yeah. or grandma, whoever, whoever uh, it was. I mean, that's that's right. really what it gets back to. Sure. Yeah. It's pretty neat. And pretty I think neat. for these smaller communities, it is a form of tourism that is very important to them. I, I grew up in a town of 500 people, and my mom owned the only diner in town. Yeah. And in deer season, when everyone would come from the Twin Cities area up there, there were three weeks where she couldn't produce enough food in that diner. And... It made for happy Christmas for her and and, and for and you, us. yeah. <laughs> you know? Mom, I need a Daisy Red Red BB red gun so I can shoot my eye out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, all those things. It, I, I mean, we bounce it around a lot, but they're all connected in, yeah. in in some way. Without access, you don't have places for people to hunt. You aren't going to have this ec- economic benefit to the rural communities. Right. You aren't going to have hunters like. I mean, if you guys didn't have so much public land and and access to that public land, because sometimes just having the public land isn't the 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 total right. solution if right. you can't get to it. Uh, people like me, I'm, I'd be like, oh, let me find some place else to go that has mm-hmm. better access. It's just mm-hmm. the the decision you make of: Am I going to travel somewhere as a non-resident hunter if access? is really a challenge right and, right and i do that at times but well, and, uh, and all our ranchers play a big role in that around the state whether mm-hmm. whether you're mm-hmm. a firm believer or not they they take care of things and they 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 maintain they maintain a lot of the waters especially in you know the southwest we yeah. just don't have a lot of water out there you know our department does a lot of just wildlife waters uh, but ranchers play a big part in that you know and yeah. you know we we go, I, I go all over the state and, and hunt and do, do what I do. And most, most of the places are very welcoming to hunters and because most hunters take, they're respectful, right? right. Uh, and there's always the oddballs, you always. know, they're always, yeah. and, and, you know, we want to, as hunters, we ought to, we ought to be taking care of that ourselves, yeah. in my opinion. Well, you know, if should, you see somebody but... that's. That's doing the wrong thing. We should yeah. we should make sure that they know they're doing the wrong thing, right? And do a little bit more a better job at self policing of our own because that's what they always point to. You always. talk to a rancher; it's always <laughs> the one guy that ripped through the whatever and yeah. drug it elk off it, uh, out of a wet meadow or something, right? Yeah. And that that's not us as a whole of uh, uh, hunters, but, but it's a big part of it. It's yeah. a big part of being respectful of what's going on, you know, and making sure. I mean. The most common complaint we get is gates being left open. Right. We were talking about that. Yeah, we talked about that yesterday. Because people The best way for us to lose access is for people to keep doing silly things like that when you could have taken two minutes to close the gate. Right. And clean up your campsites. Clean up your campsites. Yeah. (laughs) They're those simple things. But one of the things people don't understand, or a lot of people do, but some don't, or they don't realize just how much uh, importance there is to these things you just mentioned is uh, just about all the BLM and all the Forest Service is under a multiple use mandate. And therefore, there's going to be grazing and mining and logging and, and other stuff. The public land grazing is part of the equation. And it's not like the the public land allotment holder. Uh, the, everyone, you mm-hmm. get an allotment or allotments. And they don't tell the agency how they're going to do it. The agencies say, if you want this allotment, 
you're going to do this and you're going to rotate and you're going to provide this and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. So they got a bunch of requirements of what they have to do. If you leave those gates open, that's a serious problem for that rancher to be able to comply with the operating rules of his allotment. Because now he's got his cattle drifting through that gate, going someplace else where they're not supposed to be. And then he's got to round them up. It because, cost him money. Right. Well, and time. And time. And, 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 and uh, who knows what. And then he gets in trouble with the agency that he's leasing the, the, or paying the grazing lease with. So I tell people, how can you see the gates open or, or, or close and not go back? And, or how can you not close it when you're done? It'd be like saying, oh, I'm going to walk in my house and leave my door open. All right. You know? I, I think people just lose sight when... The, especially when they're on this forest service or, or BLM lands that this is a working cattle ranch too, you know, mm -hmm. it's not just here for you to hunt on and we need to be respectful of that. That's, you know, can, can become a, another sticking point with, with our ranchers. And you also got to keep in mind that a lot of these guys they're you know, they're a permittee or a lessee, but they also might own a lot of private land that might have mm -hmm. the ability to close off a big chunk of lands. Right. So when we do things when we're out on the Forest Service and BLM, we need to you know remember that and, and be a, respectful. It's a really good point because yeah. the, in order to have one of those allotments, you have to have your base acreage, which mm -hmm. is your private acreage that is attached to, or the allotment is attached to your base acreage. So that's a really good point, Kyle. Yeah. A lot of those people are like, you know, uh, people want to behave this way. I'm just going to shut sure. it down. Well, and, and often those base acres, the road goes right to that because that's where their house is, and right. then it goes off into the forest. And you wonder how can all these lands get locked up? That's, that's how it was settled. Or, it's, how, it's how it was designed. Well, the, the ranch yeah. you, you were talking about earlier that you hunted antelope on is a prime example too. He has tons of private property, but he also has the Forest Service allotment right there too. Mm -hmm. So if people go out and don't respect that, you know, Forest Service land. We're going to lose a big chunk of access up there. Yeah, so. and a lot of it is the access to their lands as part of it, but the adjacent through their public lands, lands yeah. that you get that you access through them. And what was you gave so one? You gave me Kyle a number, I think, of what you guys have at, through this program. So we're sitting at right about four and a half million um, acres. acres, but it, it is it's based on a pretty complicated. Map, you know, mapping model mm -hmm. uh, that I don't understand and can't explain. But uh, <laughs> I, come um, on, man! It, it, essentially, there's a lot of assumptions built in for how far folks are willing, you know, willing to hike in. And so we're not talking truly landlocked acres. If you're willing to hike 30 miles, it might not to be get around <laughs> all the private. <laughs> but yeah, but it, it's we have made four and a half million acres more easily accessible in the state. Yeah. Between private and the adjacent yes, public. Yes, exactly. That's a lot That's of a lot of land. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of land. Yeah, we're pretty so. proud of that as an agency. I mean, no, I, I, I don't mean, it's, it's one of those you things. You should that, be. Yeah, yeah. We're, uh, it's, we put a lot of effort into it as an agency, and, and uh, we, tied it, we try to tie all of that access back into the habitat. Mm -hmm. we, and we talk about this already a lot, but it's not just the access. Right. And that's kind of uh, for me. It's that's an important part of it because we're doing habitat dollars with access dollars. Yeah, you know, habitat work with access dollars, and it, mm -hmm. and that's the rancher's decision. Mm -hmm. That's when it comes down to the relationship. It's well, pretty simple. One of the things that's remarkable, if you come and hunt the Southwest states, I'll say Nevada, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico. I've never hunted California. I I did. I hunted one time over in the Butte Sink area, but uh, the, those other four really arid states, a high amount of public land in, in all of them. Every place you go, if there's a little two-track going somewhere, there's a rancher who's put in, we call them tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be a dirt tank or it can be a solar windmill type tank, but I suspect without all that man-made water infrastructure on the landscape, the number of, the amount of wildlife, whether it's game, non-game, whether it's birds or, right. mm -hmm. or coyotes or javelina or elk or whatever would be a lot less. Right. It, 
Couldn't say it better. You're right on. I mean, <laughs> oh, dang. Yeah, well, and that's you know that's the other big part of what our program does too is is we'll work with those ranchers on making those improvements or 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 in the case of a well, maybe converting it to solar so that you know they're not paying for generator costs and and as part of that they then turn around and leave that water on for wildlife. Because their allotment has a use period. Usually I, up in our part of the world, your allotments start sometime in June and end sometime in late September, early October. I don't right. know what it is they here. They vary but. here. You got spring allotments and fall allotments okay. and different winter allotments. But, but if someone says, hey, my cattle, I'm done. I'm not on the allotment anymore. I'm going to turn the switch off. The tank goes dry. That's not good for wildlife. No, nope, it's not. So you guys are able to help them. Yeah, we, we, we do a lot of solar conversion work, and, and like I say, then in turn they leave the water on. We also help with these dirt tank cleanouts. You know, there's lots of them down here. Those get silted in every, you know, it depends on the tank, but probably every five to ten years you got to go in there and clean that tank out, maybe reseal it with, with bentonite uh, so it'll hold water better. We do a lot of that kind of work as well. Hmm. It's wow. interesting working with ranchers on those kinds of things because you really find out that a big part of the, what 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 the ranching lifestyle is is mm -hmm. tied to wildlife too. It's not just cows. It's not just business. They love seeing wildlife out there too. Yeah. Even if they're keeping people off their ranch, yeah. any percent of times because they want you know exclusive yeah. rights to that cool wildlife that's yeah. out there. And so when you get to meet these guys, and it goes back to that relationship that that these guys have been talking about, you know, um, you can really make a huge difference on the landscape for all for everything, all wildlife, just through those relationships and recognizing that they want to do what's good for wildlife. You yeah. just have to help them. You well, have to kind of let them know what they can do, and it's not that, that much. And a lot of yeah. them are hunters, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I probably half of the guys' houses I walked into when I was in the regional position had a giant buck hanging on the wall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and a bigger story, right? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> well, you guys have cornered the market on giant bucks in some respects. You guys got the Arizona Strip. You got the Kaibab, right? You got some pretty big. We've there. seen some big whitetail down here. That's what I was gonna say. And then you got some. Is yeah. there any place north of Mexico that has? I mean, you guys, Arizona and New Mexico are the only place with cows whitetails. Yeah. Texas, yeah. right? Texas, I don't think does, Texas has Texas them yet. Done, I mean. Well, I mean, they well, might have them behind big fences somewhere. But okay. I, yeah. but Try and the, get on those. Yeah, for, no kidding. Yeah, those, those will you'll get your checkbook out. But you guys got big bucks. I cannot <laughs> believe the age class of the deer here with the amount of opportunity oh, the you opportunity. guys yeah. We've had, what, four hunts at 500 tags? Oh, yeah, some of those units are amazing. Yeah, some of the 2,500 units tags, here, yeah, it's, you know. it's a lot of tags, yeah. and there's still so much and then, opportunity. And then you look yeah. at what we've seen, right? In mm -hmm. the seven days or yeah. six, we, we've been here, I don't think there's anybody that hasn't seen something that just kind of drops their jaw. Right, thing, a real know? remarkable yeah. buck. I, in one day, I saw two bucks. One had five on the passenger side and four on the other, and then the the other buck had five on the driver's side and four on the, uh, the other. Uh, these were old bucks, and I'm thinking there's already been two thousand or what? I can't remember the number. Some crazy <laughs> yeah. number of rifle tags issued for this unit. It's unlimited over the counter archery, and there's still this age class living here. Right? Yeah, it's crazy. amazing. It's amazing. And then in the pronghorn world, you guys own the big bucks. You just need to get... I, I just can't ever draw a tag. I know. Yeah. Wait, wait, you're how many years into I don't even want to say. It'll discourage people from applying for <laughs> <laughs> So... Uh, you uh, always have... This state, you can always get lucky and draw well, a tag you know, with no points. And that's the one... Who, that, that is an amazing thing. <laughs> they didn't have that before. But, you know, you had... Well, we... You've talked about it a lot on your, your Arizona Draw series and, and how to do that. But yeah. we have a 5% that's, that gets thrown into the random pool. Right, uh, for, for non-residents. Non non and a total of 20%, of which 5% can be non-residents. And so anybody has a chance with that 5%, yeah. I mean, the non-residents. Right. So you can be drawn without the maximum bonus points. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because, well, the first part is the 20% 
five percent go into the high point pool and right. then the other eighty percent is the bonus point system. So yeah, I always ask Randy when I have a draw question about Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> but Wade, you apply for cow tags every well, year. So you, you're about as interested in the draw system as nothing. I, I'll ask Wade, you draw you draw a bull tag we can film this year? Oh no, I only applied for cow tags. So Yeah. There, it's uh, that the cow tag for me, I mean the elk hunts in Arizona for me. Mm-hmm. Is about filling my freezer. It yeah. really is. I mean, and and I I kind of look at it and put some pennies to it and start saying, okay, I I can almost I can do it cheaper living in Arizona. I can do it cheaper than I can go to the store and buy beef. Yeah, oh, just because sure. I know right where to go and I process my own meat. Right. You know, and and that you start eliminating some of those processing fees and stuff. You. Yeah. You can do it cheaply. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. On the other side of that, I love hunting quail, and that doesn't work out very I was well. Gonna say, <laughs> yeah, his, math is, his math is getting all screwy now. <laughs> yeah. You know, Wade, I am a CPA. You're going to yeah. have a hard time it's hard, it's making hard to put, that pencil out. you got to yeah. pay a little more for quality. You know? For quality, <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. yeah but. but if Val would get with the program here, you know, and get more quail, I'd get, get a quail under every bush here in Arizona. <laughs> right. Maybe you, the vol, you wouldn't have to travel so far or the number you could get, that would pencil out a little yeah. bit better. Yeah. I'll, take, would just I'll make take it, it rain. on my, my next challenge. Yeah, yeah. Can, can, you know? can you make it rain I at can. certain I can. times? I'm sending my six-year-old <laughs> through school to, to be a rain dancer. Maybe really? it'll work for us. Uh, yeah. Can't they seed the clouds or something like that? Something like that. Yeah, we'll try. We'll just <laughs> do, yep, throw it up huh. there. Yeah. Well, I would think a guy working for Quail Forever, Pheasants Forever, would be in control of the weather. You would think. You would think. I don't yeah. know. I must have to bump up a level or something <laughs> get, the, get the secret codes. <laughs> So it is, uh, which gets me to the point of uh, you do all this habitat work, you're still at the mercy of rain oh, and, wow. and yeah. moisture yeah. and other things, I would assume. We are. We are. There's some neat things that we're learning in the sage grouse world that okay. I think might apply down here. And these guys, have, these guys have been doing it for a while with the the little check dam structures and things like that. Basically, you just put a couple of rocks out on the ground and basically hold water in an area for a little while. Gets a little bit of green up. It gets, extends that. So if you have less rain, you you know you get these little pockets yeah. of microhabitat. Well, you know one of the things that that's been going on down down here is they've been doing them for erosion type situations and things. Like, all very good stuff. But yeah. what we're doing the sage grouse is using those, that same concept, but we're making them smaller, more cost effective, and putting a pile of them out on the landscape. Right. And well, uh, your Quail Forever group down here yep, in southern just Arizona, started doing that right been, now. Been, been Explain to me now. what it is. I, this is all new so to me. It's a loose rock so. structure. So they put them in these little arroyas or drainages. Yeah. And basically it catches the sediment. Yeah. And then you have you have a little, like Alice yeah. said, a little bit more moisture holding uh-huh. And typi- typically it's done as a sediment control yeah. right. uh, you know, practice. But... Yeah, a lot of people refer to them as one rock dams. Yeah. Uh, there's quite a bit of science behind it. It's not yeah. as simple as piling rocks, but volu- you know you can get volunteers involved in these things, and they're they're, they're yeah. pretty and they're, cool. And, and and we're finding that you know when you put enough, if you put enough of these small things out, not necessarily in the deep drainages that you're trying to do the erosion stuff, but just on the landscape, you have to have a little bit of you know run so you can hold right. this stuff, but. Um, we're doing a lot of work. I mean, the sage grouse is recovering because of some of these, you know, these types of uh-huh. things that we've been doing. And, uh, they, you know, they cost less than 500 bucks a pop right. to do. So you can you can get the volunteers out. You can get all kinds of people out. And I think there's real value. I mean, we'll see what happens, you know. Right. But um, if if it works, I mean, that that's something that kind of mit- mitigates that weather. You know, it, it keeps mm-hmm. the bottom up a little bit. Right, right? so yeah. you don't have the peaks and valleys. The peaks and the valleys. Highest, yeah, you try to keep those lows a little less low. Huh. Oh, so. that that explains why I just about soiled my drawers the other day when I was walking down that drainage. And what you're describing, Marcus is filming me walk through this. It's really a rocky drainage. Yeah. And there's this little grassy spot. And I, I, it must have been really pretty, uh, yeah. other than my presence there. <laughs> Marcus is filming me, and I walk into that grass, and a covey of mern squail come right out from between go. my feet. Yeah. I, I, and uh, uh, here's the bad part: I'm while I'm walking through, it's in the middle of the afternoon. I'm thinking, oh, it's seventy degrees. It's been cold that night. This would be a good time for snakes to be out and sunning themselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's what's going through my mind. So I'm kind of keeping mm-hmm. an eye as I'm walking. And then those quail take off. I bet you I jump four feet in the air. I just, <laughs> but 
it, it was interesting that I probably walked a half mile through that drainage in the first little clump of grass and vegetation I came to. That's Oof, there's some birds. Where the quail were. You didn't tell yeah. Wade where those were. I did. Apparently. I didn't. I actually, I did. I, <laughs> I, I did tell him where they were, yeah. but he took mercy on them. Yeah. I think he, Wade's kind of a quail snob, I think. I think so too. I so, think it's only when he takes me out, though. Because <laughs> you and I, we heard Gamble's quail. Yeah. And the day before, I heard Gamble's quail in there. And we, we saw him on the way down. Oh, you guys we saw him? We did see him on the way out. You did. Yes. And you didn't go after him? No, I didn't. What's the deal? I'm feeling a little sorry for the gambles this year. <laughs> oh, because of the low moisture. <laughs> yeah, we had, I mean, there was probably eight birds there. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. I, I want to leave a little seed stock sure. in those cubbies, you know. So yeah. I, 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 this year for gambles, I've been doing some dog work on them and get a lot of points and things. But I'm just, I'm just not shooting them this year. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but that's a different story with Merns this year. Right. The numbers are good. We've we've had a lot of success hunting Merns down here. And, you know, you, you talk to people and you see it all the time. Everybody's like, don't tell them where, that this is a good place to hunt Merns, yeah. right? Or don't tell them it's a good place to hunt deer. We don't want everybody right. in our spot. Right. And then you come out here and there's millions of acres. And no one's here. And no one's here. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. Yeah. So, but, but to that point, Wade, uh, why would, and I think I know the answer, why would Gamble's quail be way down and Merns be way up? Yeah, Gamble's quail rely on that winter moisture. They very much rely on December, January, a little bit into February. If we get good rainfall during that period, we'll have a lot of vitamin A on the ground in, in terms of like forbs. Okay. Green up in, the, in, the, in that early spring, and that's what gets them into breeding condition. Merns quail, they rely on the summer moisture. Which is awesome in Arizona, right? Most of the time, you'll get one mm -hmm. one season that gets pretty good precipitation. So you're almost never in Arizona without one of the birds being at fairly good numbers. Okay, right. and huh. so that's it's, it's so pretty it's the unique. timing of the moisture as yep. much as the quantity. Of yeah, the, moisture. Time, the timing mm -hmm. of the moisture is, and we've had pretty good winter rains this year. Mm -hmm. I mean, better than we've so had. far. So, so good. Far, so right? what will, that will help the gamble. The gambles, gambles yep. next year. So. But on the down, our gambles numbers have been down for a number so of years. Low. So it's going to take it's going to take some consecutive years. But we will see an increase. That's my mm -hmm. prediction that next year we'll see better numbers. So that cubby of six or eight that we saw, mm -hmm. I mean, that could turn into forty birds in a, in a you know in one year. Okay. Right. You know, and mm -hmm. so it's to me it's very important to leave some of that seed stock on the ground. You know, and yeah. uh, there's birds in other places that are going to fill those niches, but. Okay. It's nice I, to know right where they're at. I, I know where they're at for yeah. next year. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll take back my, my comment that Wade is a quail snob. <laughs> but, so w when you're, the, this is going to circle back to you, Al, because okay. of, uh, when did Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever merge? As, uh, well, Quail Forever kind of became it was about oh, 2003, was yeah. So okay. there, was, there was a group called Quail Unlimited that oh, was around. Oh, that's what I knew of. Okay. Yeah, and so Quail Unlimited uh, is, is no longer, right. in, you know, in operation. Um, and so Pheasants Forever, you know, was looking at, well, hey, wh how, how, do we, how do we expand our mission, the, the good stuff that we do? And, right. and what we do really well is implement on-the-ground habitat restoration. And we're like, wow, well, pheasant, pheasant range across the country isn't, isn't everywhere. Right. What can we do? Well, we looked at this thing called Quail Forever, yeah, and said, "Well, that's everywhere else that we're not. Let's mm -hmm. let's get into that game." And so, so Quail Forever is you know is a is an arm of Pheasants Forever Incorporated, but it, it's only been around for fifteen years, and uh -huh. you know we're uh, Quail Forever is, is growing quite quite well. You know, um, we, we're okay. we're adding lots of chapters. We're getting a lot of members. I mean, we got almost almost twenty thousand members in Quail. Quail forever compared to 120 and pheasants forever. So you know yeah. we got a long ways to go, but um, you know from a, from a from from our our perspective, those, those quail areas, those states, we can we can do a lot of good as a partner with with state agencies with, with other people to uh, to make an impact for all wildlife, especially. But right. you know the the quail too. You know so. Yeah. Um, so you guys, was it you guys telling me that Quail Forever and Arizona Game and Fish have a cooperative position? With we the, we actually or? we actually have two 
Yeah, um, three. Come we on. We have three. Yeah. yeah. What? Yeah. yeah, I forgot. The third one's relatively new, so yeah. I forgot. Um, yeah, we, we have t- two that are kind of functioning more as our landowner relations type, you know, like our usual landowner relations type folks would. Uh, and we just brought on a new guy that... Uh, is going to focus on riparian work. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think that's that's huge. You know, it doesn't jump out at you as something that maybe pheasants and quail forever would would be interested in. But like we said, what's what's good for the habitat's good for the critters. So mm-hmm. uh, I, I think it's going to be awesome. So it's, yeah. it's, joint, it's a joint It's a position. joint deal, yeah. And this is, this is what Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever does. We work with, with partners to help fill, fill needs, fill niches. Um, and so the, the two, first two that Kyle was talking about, they're, they're out there running around doing a lot of stuff like Wade does. They're building relationships, they're getting cool habitat on the ground, and they're, and they're uh, you know, developing relationships for access. And they're tying into, you know, one of our, our main partner on a lot of these is, is NRCS, you know, uh-huh. through the Farm Bill, so it ties back to that. And so... Um, so yeah, these guys are out there just basically representing multiple hats. You know, they wear the quail forever hat, but they're doing doing the work that 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 uh, the state wildlife agency wants that NRCS needs done, and and a lot of that is just boots on the ground to reach out and talk to farmers and and, and Arizona ranchers. Yeah. Um, so they do some really neat things, and it's a really great partnership for our organization because you know we, we feel we're doing what we need to do to help wildlife and to help quail. But we also, you know, appreciate, can't, can't tell you how great it is to work with Arizona Game and Fish and with NRCS. I mean, you know, when, when you're around like-minded people, you know, want to do good conservation for the right reasons, yeah. great things happen. And, um, you know, the, the position that they have down here in Tucson is working on a couple quail, speci- well, they're not speci- quail specific projects, but big landscape level quail projects that are for, you know, improving grasslands and now we're getting scale quail stuff and we're getting pronghorn habitat and corridors built out of that and then over the years huh. what's developed is you know you start those things and you're, you're doing god's work right and we're going to kill yeah. every tree out here and there's going to be grass everywhere and this is going to be wonderful and we're uh-huh. realizing wait a minute that may not be the best thing to do for the quail and, and the jackrabbits that you now love right. so much and and uh so you, you tweak those prescriptions and you start leaving some brush here and some different heights and some different things to really get those multiple species benefits and it's 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 awesome well you talk about the multiple species benefits mm-hmm. we do a the gate the department does a scaled quail survey we mm-hmm. call it the scaled quail turtle survey yeah because we, three years ago uh we had gone out and done uh some scaled quail surveys and all the dogs were finding were turtles yeah what uh, no, oh, yeah. Great. The, 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 <laughs> turtles the, the dogs point these box turtles <laughs> and <laughs> And so, so the next year we're yeah. like, okay, we're going to make this into, uh, we're going to join these up, and we're going to get the turtle biologists out there, and they're going to, and we're going to mark them, and and kind of get an idea on things, and it's been amazing. Yeah. And so if that points to the habitat, the habitat, thing. yeah. And so we're bringing in the the scale quail are coming back. They're occupying, they're occupying these areas of these yeah. treatments, and but and we're now we're also getting the handle on our on our turtle populations and what's going on with that and wow. i think you guys have found more turtles doing that than they did the past how many years yeah, they, the, they, meaning they, the, the the turtle specialists <laughs> yeah they had crazy. walked they had walked transects after transects and you know they just weren't having a lot of yeah. success so when you're not finding numbers you're thinking oh man our populations are crashing right right well got the dogs on the ground and they're finding these turtles they're like, this isn't so bad That's i think right. we're okay That's right. you know and and that ties that just ties to the to the type of work That's we're amazing. doing yeah, well, it's, it is, it is. And that <laughs> is important because you know when you think of all these species arizona's really cool they got 800 plus species they manage a lot of species these yeah. guys do and you know those species in decline get people worked up because eventually they decline to mm-hmm. a point where there becomes extra regulation right well None of us want that. That makes it hard for, for anybody to do any right. habitat restoration, and it makes it difficult on our, our ranching partners and all kinds of things. Uh, so to be able to make those links across places that tradition, you know, people right. that traditionally haven't worked together, even in the biologist world, yeah. goes a huge, huge way. I mean, that's what our riparian position is all about. NRCS is interested in southwestern willow flycatcher work. 
In what? Southwest? So, southwestern willow flycatcher. It's a little a little songbird that is in steep decline, right? And it's, it's, really? it's endangered. And so, you know, they were working with the Fish and Wildlife Service, and they're, they're coming up with recovery plans and all those wonderful things. And you wonder, well, why would quail forever care about that? Well, riparian areas are good for all wildlife. Yeah. And, uh, oh, they're kind of the artery to the, the artery southwest. for everything, right. for everything, you know. And, uh, and why are these guys interested? And why is Arizona Game and Fish interested? Well, they do have a responsibility to manage, to help manage those, those wildlife flycatcher. But the, the, the broader perspective is there's a whole bunch of people that want to do good things for these riparian areas, which will help the wolf flycatcher, help our quail, help fish, help whatever. I mean, and, that, and so when you bring all these groups together, suddenly it's not about the wolf flycatcher anymore. It's right. about what's right for the riparian and what good things are going to come out of it. And we'll see what kind of partnership. I mean, I'm, I'm working with the Audubon Society on this stuff. You know, uh-huh. that, that's something that is cool. You know, we yeah. should be working together in those, those, Absolutely. those nonprofits yeah. that Absolutely. traditionally you don't see at the table as right. much together, you know? And so, um, right. so it's, it's really cool. And, you know, and again, game and fish is great about just, Hey, whoever wants to play, we're good. So. Yeah. So I, I got, this is going to show my ignorance here, Al. So I'm sitting here with some really dedicated quail people. So maybe you can help fill in my ignorance. <laughs> I, I know what gambles quail are cause I've eaten more than my share of those. Thanks to Wade, two years ago I shot my first Mern's quail, scaled quail. What what's their range of habitat occupancy? Where they're they're endemic to Arizona? That might be a question for Wade. Weren't you just out chasing them a couple (laughs) weeks ago? So uh, I'm I'm not asking for your honey. No, no. uh, (laughs) So 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 southern southeastern Arizona is kind of their 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 hot spots. Okay. Uh, in the grassland stuff, and a lot of the grassland issues we're having are yeah. mesquite encroachment. So, uh, but the, those those scale quail, they they they've got a really stronghold in New Mexico, and then they yep. bleed over into Arizona. Mm-hmm. And there's some good, really good populations in Arizona as well. Uh, but that is one of our biggest declining habitats mm-hmm. that we have on the state level is our grasslands. Mm-hmm. And so they've been impacted uh, pretty drastically by, by mesquite encroachment mainly. So are these so, the ones that uh, have like a little one uh, feather spike on their Yeah, head? they call them cotton tops or yeah. other parts of the country call them uh, blue, blue blue quail. Yeah, I shot one in Nevada one time. Yeah. That's it, yep. yeah. Yeah. They'll, huh, get, so. they'll get up in the yeah. <laughs> I shot. I knew it was a quail because it scared the crap out of me. I chased them right. up the rock pile and I shot one of them. Yeah, but they get up in Nevada. What they're in Colorado. They're in Oklahoma. They're in Texas. Oh, really? You know, but you're right. New, Me- or New Mexico is like, that's the epicenter. Okay. Yeah. So scaled quail. Then you got your endangered masked bob whites. And that we're, are, yeah. yeah. And we're you, right we're are, right on that area where they're trying to work where they're trying to recover. Yeah, I saw that the sign. Species. Buenos Aires is Buenos right over Aires. here. Is, is Arizona the only place that has masked bob whites? Uh, Mexico. In, in the United old States. Mexico. In, yeah. in old, old Mexico. Mexico yeah. How are they doing in old Mexico? Not very really well. Really? They're not and doing I, well I, anyway. Yeah, they're just and I, I don't know the I don't know the the whole history of the masked bob white. And they've got a new refuge manager out here on Buenos Aires that's trying some pretty unique things. Mm-hmm. And it seems like it's going in the right direction. So cool. It is would, nice that that new refuge manager is trying to think outside of the box. And wouldn't it be nice to have four quail in Arizona? That would be sweet. Well, I'd love you to be California. able to hunt. Yeah, you're forgetting too, your so. California quail. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, yeah, so what's pretty. a California quail? Because you hear, you hear California quail, you hear mountain quail, you hear valley quail. Are they... What are so they? Val- oh, valley the quail, same. valley quail, and California quail are the same same birds. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, mountain quail are a uniquely different different bird. Okay. Where uh, do they live? Uh, for our California quail or mountain quail? Either. Uh, what states have them? California quail or valley quail, Nevada's, California, uh, Idaho. I mean, they're they're pretty Washington, much Washington, Oregon. They well, kind of yeah. go the west coast. Oh, really? So, yeah. yeah. I didn't and know that. A lot of people. Like in Idaho, it's not a bird that's. There's a lot of them there. Yeah, they just don't. Care. They just don't pursue them. Yeah. It's a. Really? It's an amazing. Yeah. Uh, they're too busy chasing big birds. They you got know? chuckers and cool things yeah. like that. To yeah, kill they've got big birds. Sign. Well, why don't we go chase them? We should. Yeah. Yeah. I've never shot a. I, not that I'm. So aware. the only. Th- yeah, the only thing I need to. I need to get a mountain and a California quail or valley quail, and then I'm done with my quail. And you're slime. done. Your really? quail quest oh. is over, huh? Yeah. And then we, you're, you've started on ptarmigan, from what yeah. I gather. Now that's 
that's a unique opportunity and a fun hunt. Uh, huh. Randy wouldn't do so. He'd be done with his hunt so quick because I couldn't get him to fly. <laughs> and Randy doesn't My have a problem yeah, that's right. go on the ground. Yeah. So. There's never been a if, – if it has feathered legs – it's fair game it's getting fair shot game. on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot tell you why I hold this weird, contradictory position about shooting waterfowl on the water. <laughs> but I, I will shoot. I, I, so, so you grew up I, I, chasing grouse in North Minnesota. I know. Well, that's where it, but it, <laughs> nothing against the Arkansas people. I, I have no <laughs> idea where this came from. But it's just what, in northern Minnesota. My grandpa would say, you can't Arkansas. And, <laughs> and I had no idea what the hell he was talking about. What, well, you can't shoot ducks on the water. I'm like, what, what do you mean I can't shoot? Uh, grandpa, I can shoot that grouse out of a tree. I can shoot him on a stump. I can shoot him on the trail, on the road, whatever you tell me to do. But I can't shoot that mallard out there on the pond. That's funny. I, I have no idea why this is such a stupid idea. I, so I, would, I got the same thing. My my really? my uncle is who taught me how to hunt. Not yeah. not my dad. My dad went deer hunting, but he didn't do yeah. anything else. And he was and he was the same thing. He's Ely, Minnesota, is where okay. he's from. Yeah. So yeah, can Arkansas those ducks? But yeah. you, you, any grouse you see, any way, any shape, it's dead. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Mike, uh, my apologies to the Arkansas folks. I have no idea what they <laughs> did to deserve it. that that <laughs> tag. But I have no problem <laughs> ground swatting Arkansas. Yeah. And I don't care what you sure. want to call it. So I'm not grouse. an expert on ptarmigan by any means. I've hunted them once. Okay. Okay. But if you shot them on the ground, mm -hmm. you it wouldn't be worth the hike in there because you Why? can't get them to fly. Yeah. I, my dog was on point, and I'm running after him, throwing a hat at him, trying to get him in the air. <laughs> yeah. Right? And so you could a lot of effort. The scenery is beautiful. You get up there, you'd walk into those birds, you'd shoot them, and you'd have to walk down off the mountain or just sit there and stare at the hills. For, it's just... It, in that situation... I'm not against pitting them on the ground either, but a ptarmigan, <laughs> that, that would have been... So short a hunt, it wouldn't have been worth it. Yeah, it wouldn't have been worth it. If you weren't chasing them around all morning. Oh, yeah, and watching the dog work. I hope someone walk. was watching you out there running around throwing your hat. Oh, yeah. it's a, you know, I do a lot of training with dogs, and you use a lot of pin-raised birds where you put them up, and a lot of times they just kind of run, and you got to do that to get them up in the air. Uh -huh. So you're kind of an expert on it. Yeah, I'm expert at throwing my hat okay. at birds to get them to fly, I guess. So. <laughs> I, I think we got a third business model for Al, yeah. Tarmigan. Forever. Ptarmigan forever. There we yeah. go. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm all good. I, I'm going to pursue it. We got to figure something out here to get, get us a little bit of exposure in the West. You know? so, uh, hey, one of, I just, mm. just out of side note, one of the guys I just hired, is a, he's a Himalayan snowcock. He's killed one of those? Oh, yeah. He's got it on. He's got a video. Uh, I'll show it to you. So uh, he promised he'd take me out. So maybe we'll, maybe you guys. There we go. go. Himalayan snowcock. The country. Ruby Range and the... And the uh, East Humboldt in Nevada are the only place I know have. Is there some other place that has Himalayan stuff? That's, that's it. That's, that's it. it. Yeah. I saw one. You did? Yeah, when we were up there deer hunting in 2011. No, really? 2012. Yeah. Don't tell Wade, Randy. He's probably going to load up his truck when he gets I home. Was in the, I was in the East Humboldt. Right. Well, there we go. We'll have to, instead of meeting in Arizona, we'll meet in Nevada okay. next time. You, you, you realize that these guys, uh, how wild these birds are i've heard that i yeah. are you bringing shiloh dog with no i wouldn't I, I would treat that as a i don't know i hate to say it but as a big game spot and stock spot and stock kind of thing okay that's I, how most people do it yeah, yeah and uh we saw one and it saw us it took off and that thing flew forever he saw us from a long way away. I mean, we were. So it's not like you can follow up on the flush, huh? <laughs> well, you could, <laughs> but you better not be doing anything for a long for the next twelve hours. <laughs> I've seen the country they've lived in. Just put it that way. That's I. I that's as close yeah. as I. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Close as I'm, I'm come to it. Huh? So, Valley Quail, California Quail. What What's the difference between them and say a Gamble's Quail? They look very similar. They, yeah, they, they have a little curly cue on they them. They have a curly cue on them. Are they just size difference? Or size difference. They've got a little bit of difference in plumage, yeah. and, and I'm just not an expert on them because, well, for a lot of you reasons, but they're yeah. not in Arizona right. in heart large abundance. Yeah. We have yeah. one small little population uh, up around the Springerville area, which uh, we've done some transplants recently uh, to try and 
expand their range just real locally. Mm -hmm. uh, they're they're just they're not abundant. Uh, it, it, it takes a lot of a lot of work to try and find them. So okay, well. I'm I'm all about that. Uh, the reason I shoot so many blue grouse and rough grouse is they're abundant and they're easy to find. <laughs> and they taste good. And they taste, and they taste really good. Now, I, I, I'm kind of a grouse snob. I'll take a rough grouse over any of the other grouse species all day, every day. I haven't had the opportunity to hunt hunt rough grouse, so I really, hoping, yeah. Well, I keep, threatening, you, well, I keep threatening to come up to Montana up there. All you got to do is come elk hunting with yeah. me. Every elk <laughs> hunt turns into a grouse hunt. <laughs> you got a slingshot in your pocket? You ever do that? I, I shoot them with broadheads. Do you? People say, who would use a $30 broadhead on a grouse? I would. <laughs> That's, that's a good use of my of my time and my money. And, yeah. my, and, and it's your sure good camp eye. meat, right? For sure. They never make it home. I, I got to tell the camera guy, don't tell my wife that we shot four <laughs> grouse today. Because if we eat them in camp, my wife loves grouse. Oh, well. You, you got a bird problem going on, Kyle, like Wade does? No, no. no. I, I don't have the bug like Wade has it. Um, it's we, it's been, a, been a blast down here this trip, though. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, a blast. Is that a pun? <laughs> <laughs> so when i do get my quail slam then i'll the, what i'll have to do is i'll have another dog coming up and i'll have to get it with that other dog uh, yeah. so it's got to go. be the quail slam with each dog i have there so you go. okay that's kind of a that'll take me yeah. a while so i keep me in dogs and <laughs> birds for a while so. all right yeah this, this well, podcast well. pass has quickly turned into wade planning a bunch of hunts yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, every, part, but part of that is age you you guys look significantly younger than wade now uh, so when you get to about 50 once you get to 50 you look at your calendar and you start planning all kinds of things don't you wait absolutely like, i gotta do this i gotta do that i got you you become the old there's the old saying beware of an old man in a hurry you become the old man in a hurry <laughs> well there's only so many years you have left right. to do this yeah. stuff so you got to get it done i, I mean my thought yeah. oh man but, well, I it's don't want to hold you guys too much longer, but for Al and for Kyle, I want to give you guys the the time to to just let the audience know what what important things that you would want want to leave them with, and sure. the, you know, and work that you guys do, and how how Great. how we can help. Kyle, you want to go first? Yeah, I, I'll leave you with a couple of thoughts here. Um, one 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 of the main things I wanted to touch on with that we already mentioned was just making sure folks are respectful. Our hunters are respectful. I think most of them are when they're out here, you know, hunting. Keep in mind these are working cattle ranches in most cases. Um, close the gates, pick up your trash, simple things like that go a long ways. Um, one other thing that we did talk about a little bit yesterday, but didn't get to mention today was uh during your draw, which elk and antelope is open right now, um, you also have an opportunity to donate to our hunter donation account. Mm -hmm. um, and our program uses all those dollars to do beneficial habitat work like what we discussed today. So um, there's a website there you can go to. Little shameless plug for that. Okay. So is it is it something where I'm... Because I don't recall when I'm going so through So as you're my stepping through the process, yeah. um, it will ask you if you, if you want to donate and it points you to our webpage that... We'll basically go through a list of some of the projects that we've done with with the money. So okay. you can't miss it. Okay. Don't miss it this time, Randy. <laughs> I won't miss it. I, I apologize. I'll have to double down for my donation this year. So, huh? I, I want you guys to. I want you to have a job, Kyle. I, yeah. I mean, you, rumor had it that if you brought Kyle on a deer hunt, you were going to see big bucks everywhere. Yeah. And, and, that didn't turn out to be true. Well, you saw them everywhere. <laughs> we saw them everywhere. That's true. True. We did see. We did see one. They weren't really in very stockable locations, no. and it didn't pan out. But we saw them. I oh, know. Yeah. Well, I, I. You'll see when the footage comes out. I blamed you for all that. So. That's right. <laughs> so, you know, we we shouldn't have brought that Kyle guy with. We were told that he was the ringer, but. Well, what did we have? We had a thirty percent success, or somewhere close to that. 
Oh, for the for the other guys. I'm Randy's the talking about him talking specifically. About yeah, he's always <laughs> talking about himself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he wants his picture up on the wall in that store. I do. I want. I want to. I want. We're up where they're selling uh, the the fudge sickles. There, I want my picture right above the fudge sickle <laughs> category. But no, we 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 actually this is the fir- this is our third year coming down doing this, and every year we invite a few more people. Pretty soon we're just going to have to rent a, our own motel or something. Why not yeah. just rent the whole town? <laughs> yeah. We had people in tents this trip. I know. This house is huge. Yeah. This house, they say sleep 16, but you got to be pretty friendly. <laughs> with, <laughs> little if cozy, you're, yeah. you're going to sleep two in my room, uh, uh, <laughs> the only way two are fitting in my room is if it's me and my wife because it's <laughs> one bed. So. But, uh, yeah, we, uh, you know, we... We've had a ton of fun, and two of the guys arrow to deer. That's awesome. Not and me. you got a javelina. And I got a javelina. Last year, Marcus and his wife, Kara, both got javelinas. Uh, so, yeah, we're, but the, here's the problem. The two guys who arrow to deer didn't have a, a camera with them. Uh, they, they weren't <laughs> filming it. Well, that's, that's how, you know what? Then that's why we blame it on the, that's the fact that the cameras are there, why you're not able to get one. All right, I told you guys the rule. First, first place of blame is always the camera guy. If something <laughs> goes snare wire, it's the camera guy. I wasn't uh-huh. gonna say it. I just said because the camera was there. Those poor uh-huh. cameramen. We can't. <clears throat> we can't say that about them. I can. <laughs> I signed the front. It's of good their to be the boss. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. right. I signed the front of the paychecks, not the back of the paycheck. So I can say whatever I darn well want. <laughs> but uh, oh, no, that's cool. I, those are good points, Kyle. I'm, I'm glad you brought them up. I'm glad you took the time to come down, spend a couple of days with us. Yeah, and, it, it's been a blast. Thanks, Randy. And when Arizona decides they're going to relieve you of your ten elk points, will you let me know if I can? Uh, do you have any help in filming and telling the story? That's quite possible. All right. Because <laughs> Wade, it, this guy has been, I've known him for 30-some years. He's so camera shy. It's only been the last year or two I've been able to get him on camera. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't enjoy it either. But No? Yeah. Oh, well. We're, we're with friends this evening, so it, it makes it a little bit easier. Okay. <laughs> it does make it easier as you get more... More in tune to what's yeah. going on and kind of relax a little bit, but yeah. I'm not one to stand up in front of people and do much of anything, let alone be on camera that's stuck <laughs> there forever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's getting everything. easier. It's getting easier. Well, that's good. That's cool. Well, Al, I, I want the, the elevator speech on why uh, I should become a member of Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever. I hate that term, elevator speech, okay. but I love uh, Pheasants call, Forever Quail Forever. All right, I'll call it something else. I want... No, I'm not going to call it a sales pitch either. I want the compelling reason that I'm a hunter and I'm concerned about wild we places. We are and the wild habitat things. organization. That's okay. what that's what our tagline is, and we're darn good at it. These shared positions we were just talking about, yeah. we're pushing 200 of those. Mm-hmm. You know, our organization started with six people. Really? In 1982, we're now pushing 400 people as an organization, of which half of them are these shared positions. Yeah. We're good at getting stuff done on the ground. Yeah. Stuff meaning wildlife conservation, habitat conservation, opening up access, and getting people outside. Okay. And, 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 you know, I'm a little biased, or a lot biased, but I think, oh. you know, our organization, that's our biggest strength, and, and, and we're better at getting people on the ground to help with these partnerships to get to change, you know, turn the dirt than any other nonprofit conservation yeah. organization. Well, I... I've been a beneficiary of your organization's work where yeah. I pheasant hunt in Montana. Yeah. So yeah. we are, and, and, and we are truly, you know, and all, I mean, we're, we're pheasants and we're upland, you know, we're, we're mm-hmm. focused on that, but we are truly uh, looking out for all wildlife. We are a conservation organization. Yeah. We stress that, um, you know, and, you know, we are also a national organization now with the quail right. forever, pheasants forever type of thing. And and one of the things that, that I've found in the West yeah. is, is pheasants forever comes with a with a very known kind of you know brand yep. and why do we why do you why are you talking to me about mule deer why are you talking to me about quail you're pheasants forever well 
you know, that's that's a strength that we have, but yeah. it's something that that uh, we can overcome by by focusing on what we do best, which is that habitat conservation yeah. work. And we're everywhere, you know, um, yeah. and we're doing stuff in every single state, and uh, and we are not shy about partnering with everybody, and we want to partner with everybody, and we want to we want to bring people together. Yeah. So th- if if someone uh, because I run into a lot of people say so, you know. I, I really like doing the fundraising. And that's fine. There's a place yep. for that. And then I run into people who say, you know, I really don't care for the fundraising part, but do you have any boots on the ground, yeah. hands on, get yeah. my fingernails yeah. dirty projects? Yeah. That's us. That's us all the yeah. time. I mean, how, so how would someone find out about Pheasants Forever? Or Pheasant. or pheasantsforever.org. Yep, pheasantsforever.org, coilforever.org. You know, I would send you there. Um, and you can then find any any local chapter. You know, we're like a lot of these conservation organizations. We've got local chapters. We have staff scattered, like I was saying, across the country. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's links to all those people. So if you, you know, if somebody that you run into wants to know what's going on in, in, in you know, Colorado, mm-hmm. go to the webpage and, hey, there's people that are working for Pheasants Forever in Colorado. What are they doing? And you can call them right up and talk to them. So, cool. Yeah, we're putting on almost two, it's, we're pushing two million acres per year of on-the-ground habitat restoration. Wow. Which is which is pretty cool, yeah. you know, and, and we're proud of that, you know. One of the other things that people may not be aware of, uh, Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever, we've, we've been... Uh, public land creators since 1982. Mm-hmm. We, uh, in the Midwest, where, you know, in the farmland where you're from, you know, we got 200,000 acres that we've purchased over the years that are now wildlife wow. management areas, you know, waterfall production areas, some sort of, yeah. you know, open public kind of thing. Um, and so that's a lot of habitat that's, that's restoration. And that's a lot of, that's a lot of opportunity that, that we just keep working and partnering on and, and doing more and more of those kinds of things. Yeah. So, Wow. Um, yeah, you know we're 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 there to to do what's right for the resource. And if if anybody's out there that want you know thinks that's cool, give give me a call or give us a call, and you know we'll we'll put you in the right direction. Cool. Well, I for folks listening, a, a lot of them will ask me, Newberg, how do you get so dialed into a lot of this legislative stuff and this congressional stuff. It's because in my Rolodex, I have guys like Allied and I can <laughs> call and say, hey, Al, what's going on with the yeah. farm bill? I need, yeah. I, tell, give me some insider. And then I've got other people, hey, what, what's going on with this? What's going yeah. on with that? So I appreciate your willingness to... Uh, I call it you hold your nose and you go to D.C. Yeah. <laughs> long, long time to hold your breath, but uh, it's part of the necessary work that has to be done. It, it's fair, a, it's is, important. Yeah, and I would say, hey, you know, we say everyone likes to hunt. Not everyone likes to raise money. Not everybody likes to do conservation work. Even fewer people like going to Washington, D.C. <laughs> and lobbying on behalf of wild places and wild yeah, things. So yeah. the fact that you and a lot of the conservation groups do that is, is yeah, very it, helpful. It's wonderful working picture. with all the conservation organizations and all those things. You know, it doesn't it doesn't yeah. matter what, what part of legislation there is. It, those common voices, those, those shared voices are important. And your public lands you know, platform is something that we completely support, and that's you know as we should. Yeah. And 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 I can't imagine a conservation organization that doesn't. You yeah. Know? And so, uh, legislation for habitat restoration, legislation for anything, it's how things get done in this country still. You know, yeah. and we. You know, I appreciate everything you do, keeping oh. me tied into all those other things I don't have time to listen to. <laughs> so. uh, well, wait, I'd give you the last plug, but uh, you and I are going to talk ptarmigan <laughs> after we turn off the mic. Because <laughs> <laughs> do I, I don't want this ptarmigan population you found to get exploited too heavily. So. Right. <laughs> as long as there's still enough, still a, a an abundance there, a surplus that a guy can go and ground sluice a few of them. <laughs> Count me in. You'll be bored. Even you will be bored of shooting these birds no, on the ground. You, you have never seen me chasing <laughs> birds on the ground. I'll find a way to make it fun. Okay. <laughs> Trust me. I. If you want to see Randy Newberg revert back to when he was 10 years old, just give me my 410 and a bird of a grouse type thing on the ground. 
and it, it, it will be like Ralphie and his red right Daisy Red Rider BB gun. So, but well, guys, thanks. I've taken a lot of your time. I know it's a oh, late no. evening, but can't thank you all for the work you do for being so helpful to to us, our platforms, and and a lot of hunters who get you guys bump into and contact that contact you. You guys are very generous with your information and. Uh, my experience watching you guys interact with other hunters besides us is you're all about wanting them to be successful and, and have a good time. And so I appreciate it. There are customers. Thank you. Yeah. They're your customers. That's a good way to put it, Wade. I'm glad that you guys look at it that way. So anyhow, folks, from uh, Southern Arizona, Quail ca Mern's Quail, capital of Southern Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, so I've been saying that this week. Yeah, we're in Southern Arizona, the quail capital of Southern Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, thanks for listening. Don't know uh, where we'll be at the next time we put the headphones on, but appreciate all of you downloading and sharing this podcast.